to 3. These t short chap verses. Let's read them together, actually, in one, uni one voice, one unison. Acts chapter 13, verses 1 to 3. Let's read them together in one voice. And we'll read from the English Standard Version. It is the Word of God together. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Mene, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Amen. This is the word of God. I love, church, I love uh, world history and uh, the centuries of 15th to 17th century Western civilization was a time of exploration, great exploration. And it was at that time when this continent, the Americas, North and South Americas were discovered. And this was at this time when the continent of Africa was explored and new lands and territories were found uh, by the Westerners. And uh, we recall from our church, not church history, world history that, you know, Spain, Portugal, and, and England, they were competing to find, they were, they were trying to find the best route, the trade route, the colony, to make more money, economic prosperity and wealth. They were competing for more land, in fact. In the history of the world, one person's name is uh, actually prominent in this period of history. And you probably know this guy very well. His name is Ferdinand Magellan. Right? He is known for his Magellan Strait. Um, do we have some map there? We probably do, yeah. And he's known as the person who circumnavigated the earth for the first time in ever in human history. And he proved that the earth was not flat. He traveled one direction and he came back the same place where he started. He, he proved that with his voyages. So the, he was a Portuguese, but he was commissioned by the Spanish king. And uh, he took five vessels out into the Atlantic Ocean, hopes of going, getting to the Spice Islands. These are islands in the Indonesian, uh, the islands in Asia, to make money. But uh, so he didn't know, they didn't have a map. We have a map here, we see what the world looks like today, obvious. But imagine you're traveling for the first time, you're navigating through waters, uncharted waters literally. And you're, you're gliding down the South America western, eastern coast, down south. And you don't know how big this land is, how big this continent is, where it ends and where you will meet new waters, new ocean. Would it be the edge of the world? Would you fall and, and die and perish? It was very uncertain. But uh, he eventually found this strait uh, down in South America. Uh, and uh, he stayed there, and he actually harbored there. He ported there for over the winter until the winter uh, storm and the wind subsided. And when it's, finally the weather gave out, uh, they were able to, to navigate to a new ocean. And after all that suffering and tor tormenting and, and uh, difficulty, they came into calm waters. It was a, such a peaceful ocean that he called it Mar di Pacifica, which means the peaceful sea, the Pacific Ocean. That's where we get the name Pacific Ocean. And he told his men, we'll travel three weeks and we'll be at the Spice Islands. And it ended up being three months because he did not know how far big this ocean was. He just traveled on and on and on and westward on and on until he got to the Philippines and there he died. He couldn't finish his trip, but his uh, first in command, Kanon, uh, I believe that was his name, he took command and he, they, they finished the rest of the trip down to the Indian Ocean and down south of Africa and all the way up to the coast back to Spain. And there was a big parade, but it was so costly because they start with five ships and they came back with one, Victoria, the, uh, the ship Victoria, and uh, it cost them hundreds of men and it took them three years to finish this journey. Imagine, you know, we think, oh wow, this, you know, it's the world, they just, well, big deal, circumnavigated the world. 
But uh, if you don't have a map, if you don't know how far things are and what uh, weather you're about to encounter, it would be a very scary yet exciting time. Today we have satellites and we have maps of the entire world. So there are no uncharted territory. So don't go out there trying to explore and find a new island for yourself and you know, put a flag on there as your kingdom. There are none, I assure you. Although the age of exploration is, exploration is done, there still is an exploration yet to be unearthed. And we call that the spiritual explora- exploration. The Holy Spirit has, is leading us to uncharted spiritual kingdom of God. We live in this small world. We have our religion. We have our faith. We have the view of our God. And it's so small, so small. You and I, our view of God is so small uh, compared to the actuality, reality of how grand, how big, how great is our God. And the Holy Spirit is the navigator. He is the wind. He is the power. He is the sail even that pushes us, extends our horizons and borders to see the depth and the wealth and the richness of God's kingdom. That's what the Holy Spirit does. And that's what Led by the Spirit series has been all about. We all have an image, an idea, and even experience of who the Holy Spirit is. But He is so much more than just your small God that you have perceive every day. He is the Spirit of God who expands horizons, who expands the kingdom of God for us. He invites us to be explorers, not just individual explorers, but as a church, as a group, to explore, to journey this, this thing called the journey of faith together. And the Holy Spirit pushes us on. This morning, I want to look at this one last, last message on the Spirit, which is, what is the church that is being led by the Spirit of God? What does the church that is led by the Spirit of God look like? What is that church that we can find in the New Testament, and how can we be led as a church by the Spirit of God? This is our concluding message in the Spirit series. And uh, we look at two churches this morning from the New Testament, from the book of Acts. The first church is the church of Jerusalem, and the second church is the church of Antioch. And they're very closely related. Although we read only chapter 13, our story starts in chapter 11. And uh, we know, we've heard from last previous weeks that the, um, the church, the Jerusalem church was persecuted. So all the, the saints, all the members, most of the members were scattered all over the empire. It was God's way, the Holy Spirit's way of expanding his kingdom. We saw a particular person last week. We saw the, the person Philip. He was a leader. He was an appointed leader of the Jerusalem church. And God, the Holy Spirit led him down to the highway, remember? High, highway from Jerusalem to Gaza at the appointed time to meet this eunuch, this Ethiopian person. He was able to share the gospel with him. And the entire nation of Ethiopia, even today, is a Christian nation because of the Holy Spirit work. But today, we see a bigger scale of the Holy Spirit working in a church to expand his kingdom. And it starts with the church in Jerusalem. The church in Jerusalem was, as you, as you know, we've heard many times, it's persecuted and they scattered, right? In chapter 11, verse 19, this, chapter, this verse tells us exactly the places where these people were scattered to and what they did along the way. In chapter 11, verse 19, it says this. Do we have that on the screen? Yes, thank you. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over the Stephen incident uh, um, uh, traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, Antioch. Going back to the map, Faisal, brother Faisal, you know, they started in Jerusalem, but they spread north and to the, the west, right? They went to Phoenicia, which is the end land of Samaria at that time, Galilee. And then they went all the way up to Antioch and uh, they went to the, the island of, of Cyrene. They uh, spread the gospel there, speaking the word to everyone, to all the Jews that they met. Why? Because they were Jewish, Jewish people. Like if you were traveling to Europe and you don't know the local culture and language, you would naturally go to you know, a Korean restaurant or a Chinese restaurant and, and, and ask people and ask for services there, whatever. These Jewish people, Jewish Christians also were in unfamiliar territory. And so they went to the synagogues to share 
the gospel and many people believed. But something extraordinary happened in the process, right? Especially those Christians from Jerusalem who were more of a Gentile culture. They were more Greek culture. And we see their names in verse 20 of chapter 11. It says, But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene. Cyprus is, that, again, the island in Mediterranean. And uh, Cyrene is an African city, a North African city. And from their people, uh, these Christians came to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists. They start to speak the gospel in Greek. Not in Aramaic or Hebrew, but in Greek. In their language, they understood, the Romans understood. And amazingly enough, there were many people who became Christ followers. And the Bible describes it this way, 21. How was that, po was that possible? And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great member, uh, great uh, number uh, who believed turned to the Lord. And when Jerusalem Church heard of the, about this, that there are many people converting to Christianity, there are many Greeks, many Romans changing to being, becoming a Christian followers, Jesus followers, and they were starting to form a church in Antioch. The church in Jerusalem just could not stand still. She sent out people, especially one elected person, Barnabas. Remember Barnabas? From previous time, he was the exemplary, like deacon, like the servant, the leader of the church, who who um, dedicated. He offered his his uh, his um, property, the whatever he saw, he got for the property, and laid at the feet of the disciples, so that the church could benefit the 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 widows and the poor people. Right? He was famous. He was a respected leader of the church, and so the church sent out Barnabas to investigate and also to edify this church in Antioch. And sure enough, he saw what God was doing. Barnabas saw what God was doing, and the work was great. He preached the gospel, and more people became strengthened in the gospel and became Christ followers. So he invited his friend, Saul, who later becomes Paul, who is fluent in Greek and Greek culture. And together, they worked together to build up this amazing church. And... Uh, the kingdom of God is, was expanding in this region of Antioch. Let me pause right there. The Bible simply says the hand of God was there, and so there were many Christians in that area. But how did, do you think, assume it really happened? Because it's rare for somebody to believe somebody else is God, right? For a Greek, for a Roman person to believe in Jesus, this Jewish person who died and resurrected, it was kind of weird. Tim Keller explains it this way. He says that in, in those days and culture and times, the identity of your, your people group was tied to a specific God. If you were a Jewish person, you worship Yahweh God. If you were a Roman citizen, you worship Zeus or you worship the emperor. There was an attachment, a bond between you and a God. So for somebody else to worship the God, Jesus, was extraordinarily weird. And it was really uh, not very advantageous for them either because now Christianity, as we call it now, was not very favorable before, uh, in front of the Roman people. They were being persecuted. They were being stoned by their own people, the Jews. Why would you want to believe such a small, cultic religion? What was going on? Why were they able to open their hearts? It was because there was something different about Christianity. They, well, well, everybody else was so closed and they were worshiping their own God for their own benefit and for their own sake. These Christians were open. They invited anyone and everyone to their community. Whether you were poor, whether you were paralyzed, whether you were a slave, whether you were a free man, whether you were of noble birth, whether you were a Roman citizen or not, it didn't matter. And, and they saw this amazing generosity. When the world talks about benefiting yourself and, and you have to fight for your rights and, and you have to make your own living and all that. These people were talking about forgiveness. They were talking about generosity. They were talking about love. When they, these people, when the Roman people saw this, this was something special. This was beyond human understanding. This must be God. 
And so when they heard the message that Jesus Christ came to this earth to die on behalf of their sins, all of our sins, for God so loved the world that God, he sent his only begotten son to die for us on the cross. When they heard the message that he not only died on the cross for our sins, but he resurrected on the third day, he resurrected and he still lives. He is at the right hand of the throne of God. Their hearts were strangely warmed and their lives were changed. And many came to become followers of Jesus Christ. I believe if there were a news reporter in those days in Antioch, Antioch Times or Antioch Chronicle, whatever, he would write headline, a, a new breed of community forms, and then colon, Christians. And that's what the Bible says. For the first time ever in history of the church, these people were started to be called Christians. What a beautiful name. They're, they were identified not by a people group, not by a region, but they were identified by a person, God, Jesus Christ. They were Christ people, Christ followers. And who saw all this happening from far away south? The Jerusalem church observed what the Holy Spirit was doing. They did not orchestrate this. They did not plan this ahead of time. It was surely the work of the Holy Spirit. The church that is led by the Spirit sees what the Spirit of God is doing. That is the first step. Why do you think the Spirit showed the Jerusalem church all that was happening? Just for your entertainment? Just for, you know, show? No. It was for them to participate. And participate they did. They sent Barnabas and Paul to strengthen this amazing church. And God did amazing things. Those who seek to be led by the Spirit of God, those who have the openness, those who have the eyes, will be led, will be seeing the things that the Holy Spirit shows us. I want to remind us of a, of a verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 to 10. In fact, let's read it together if we can. This verse talks about what the Holy Spirit does for his followers. And together, let's read. But, as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him, these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. Verse 10, these things God has revealed to us. He has shown us. He opened our eyes through the Holy Spirit to see not the everyday, day-to-day, -day, earthly, material things in history, what we see on the news, but the very deep things that is on the heart of God. Indeed, God showed the Jerusalem church what was on the heart of God. The Holy Spirit showed them the amazing heart changes in the people of the Greek people in Antioch. God loves us and he wants to lead us. The Spirit of God wants to lead us and show us what he is doing. We are led by the Holy Spirit when we are open to him. Do you see the Holy Spirit work in our church, in your church? Every year I pray to God, God, would you open my eyes to see where you are working? Indeed, he is working. Would you open my eyes, my heart, to see what direction that we should go? Up to this point, you know, um, our, what the Spirit of God has shown us is very apparent. And it is to serve our local community. What's the name of our church, by the way? Cornerstone. You kind of forgot, right, what our church name was. It was on the sign, but you kind of forgot on the way here. What's the name church? It's called Cornerstone Community church. Why is it, are we a community church? Community. It uh, signifies a message from the Holy Spirit, I believe, to serve our local communities first. To serve people in Palo Alto. To serve the people in the Bay Area. To, for, for them to experience the Holy Spirit. To experience the salvation, gift of salvation that is given to them so freely. Maybe that's why Maybe not, that's not maybe, that's indeed why. We go out to Palo Alto train station every month, every Saturday, to let them know that there is God and we are following him. And we also do a VVS every year for that purpose, to, for this community. We have the Heritage Home Ministry and we have the Guiding Light Ministry. We support them in San Jose for this very purpose that we are a community 
of people who follow Jesus and we are led by the Spirit to do these things. But there was one question in my mind that was in my mind for many years. And it was this. Holy Spirit, where is our end of the earth? We know our Jerusalem, our Judea and Samaria is here and in this area. But where is the end of the earth for us? It's too big. Everywhere is the end of the earth. But where is our end of the earth? So in the effort to find, to hear, to, to uh, see what the, where the Holy Spirit leads, you know and you've heard over the years that you've been with me that we've been through many parts of the world. Do you have some pictures of that, Faisal? And uh, we've been to, just in random order here, not, next slide please, next slide. Uh, we've been to you know, Kyrgyzstan, we've been to Nicaragua, Guatemala, Mexico, Turkey, and, and uh, where else have we been? Many, many places. And everywhere we went with, as a mission team, we were seeking God, show us where your heart is for these people. And uh, over the summer, as we were in, Nicara in Guatemala this summer, I finally came to a conclusion. I felt the Holy Spirit was speaking to us. It was when we encountered this church called uh, San Pedro, First Baptist Church of San Pedro and Pastor Raul. Seeing him in his ministry blessed me so much. Because we see a lot of church buildings in Guatemala. We see a lot of poverty in Guatemala. But we see the churches being empty because there is no spiritual leader that is able to preach what God's message is for them. That Jesus Christ is the Lord and Savior and how to follow him. There is not that spiritual, there's a spiritual void. We've been to Guatemala many years, but this time it was different. And when I encountered this church in San Pedro and saw Pastor Raul's heart to serve the 12 villages in that lake area, a Titlan area. He is serving the churches, the leaders, to build up these churches to be evangelical churches, to be gospel prison churches. It resonated with my heart. I, I, had, I had this, this uh, warmth, winter warmth within me. And I wanted to commit to this ministry to support Pastor Rao. Instead of any material missionary efforts, want to, yes, we do have to support them material-wise and money-wise, but financially, but we, the more importantly, they need the, the gospel. They need to understand how to teach the gospel and share the gospel in that region. We have the opportunity to share, um, a, do a pastor seminar. We have opportunity to do a teacher seminar. We have opportunity to sh teach them how to share the gospel with the people around them. It is my prayer and my wish that uh, our Cornerstone Church would continue to involve, be involved where the Holy Spirit has been showing us. He has been showing us where His work is. And it is a blessing to be able to see where that is. The point is, for us to be led by the Spirit of God, we need to see, we need to perceive where His work is at. We will continue on Work, do the work of the evangelist, do the work of the, serving the community continually in this region. But we will also be led by the Spirit of God to continue to do the end of the earth ministry in Guatemala as well. This is basically the concept. Wherever he leads, we'll go. We will go. Not just Pastor Joseph go, but wherever he leads, we will go. I pray that that will be our prayer and our desire. The Holy Spirit is working around us. Do you sense Him? The Holy Spirit is always working. God is always around Him. And the purpose for you individually is that through these, you know, leading of the Spirit, that we will be able to share, you will be able to share your faith in your schools, in your workplaces, and in your community. And so, Again, these are training opportunities for us to participate in our church as a church as we go out to Palo Alto train station, as we go out to missions. Uh, one small announcement, which you already know, is every first Saturday of the month, it's 7th of September this time, we will go out to resume our going out to Palo Alto train station to share, just share with anybody that uh, Jesus Christ is the Savior and Lord of our lives. I invite you to that. Again, you don't know what you don't know. If you have never been there, you uh, don't know what, how the spirit, spirit, what the Spirit shows you. 
And uh, we, we, I pray that our church would be a church being led by the Spirit as we see Him work in our lives every day. How is the church led by the Spirit? We are led when we see the Spirit. But second, we're also led by the Spirit when we hear the words of the Spirit. Not only do we see the work of the Spirit, but we hear the words of the Spirit. The passage we read this morning together, chapter 13, is the second church, the church in Antioch, the church we've been talking about all along this morning. And uh, this church has matured now. After some time, we find that there are leaders in this church. Going back to verse 1 of chapter 13, it gives us some names, important names of this church. Right? In verse 1 it says, Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, namely Barnabas, Simon, who is called Niger, Lucius, Cyrene, and Manus, uh, Manaean, Manaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. Like a bookend, we know two names, right? Barnabas and Saul we know. Barnabas and Saul were sent by the Jerusalem church as the leaders. Maybe like a pastor or a teacher of the Word of God. What's amazing is all these other names we are really surprised to see. There is this person called uh, Simon or Simon, called Niger. Uh, probably he was an African person, right? Uh, Niger means black in Latin. Lucius of Cyrene. Cyrene was a North African city. He probably was black as well. And uh, Manaean is a very interesting person, character. It's, he's described he's a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch. Herod the Tetrarch was the king when Jesus was alive in Galilee. Galilee. And so this guy grew up together with this, you know, he was of a noble blood. Maybe he was in the royal court somehow. And this guy believed in Jesus. And he was a leader of the church. His name was written here in, uh, among the leaders of the church in Antioch. Now, to these leaders, as they were, verse 2, as they were serving the Lord and as they were fasting and praying. So it means they were worshiping the Lord. Worship service, right? <laughs> worshiping the Lord. They were hearing the word of God through a pastor or Barnabas or, or Saul. And uh, they were also praying in their private times uh, a unhindered focused prayer. That's what fasting prayer is, isn't it? It's just even putting aside even food, any distraction for a period of time to focus solely on God. And when they did, when they heard the message preached, when they were praying unhindered, focused prayer, the Holy Spirit spoke to them. This is a very unique phrase that we've never seen up to this point. Verse 2, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And verse 3 says they did. They prayed some more and they prayed for Barnabas and Saul and they let them go for kingdom work. This church was pretty mature at this time. And uh, we find this interesting phrase that the Spirit spoke to the church. How is that possible today? How can we hear the voice of the Holy Spirit? How can you hear what the Spirit says to you clearly? Not just see what the Spirit does, but hear what He's saying. How can we hear that today? You might think, oh, I need to go into a monastery or go into that fasting prayer mountain over there and just you know, pray like crazy and maybe I'll hear something. Maybe you will hear something. Hallucination or something. We could. Uh, I'm not saying that we cannot hear the Spirit that way. But we have something today that they did not have, which is the printed Word of God. They did not have the words of Jesus. It was only heard in the preaching of the apostles and the leaders. They did not have... Bible study. But we have the whole 66 books of the Word of God. And who is the author? Happened to be the author of these books? It's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit speaks to us as we do our daily quiet time in the Word of God. I want to be very specific. What they did back then, the first church in Antioch, they meditated and they prayed, we can do today as well as we do our daily quiet time in the Word of God. Do you really want to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit? 
we can hear his word, uh, voice through the word of God. Let me back, what I, back up what I said, back that up with evidence. There's a, a second time that the similar phrase is used in the New Testament. And it is in the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3. Jesus is speaking to the seven churches. And he tells John, who is, you know, disciple of Jesus, he's at the end of his age, write down these letters to these churches and have them sent to the seven churches of Asia Minor. And after each of the reading, after each of the proclamation of what Jesus says to the church, I want you to say this. Uh, can you have that on the screen? Let's read it together. Chapter 2, verse 7. Read it together. Ready, go. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. It is re repeated seven times for each church. This is a message for us. That after the scripture was written, it was intended that this message would be heard to his church, Cornerstone Church, and to... Listen and obey what the Spirit says through the Word of God. Well, this time I'm, I'm very serious about this. My, this is my desire and heart that I truly want our church, Cornerstone Church, to hear the voice of the Spirit as each of us. You are the church. This church is not an abstract thing. You are the church. Each of us hears the voice of the Spirit in our daily quiet time. What is the quiet time? It is an unhindered, undisturbed dating time with God. When you are dating, any of you dating? Celibate? <laughs> Married? You're still dating when you're married, I hope. Uh, you're not distracted by a cell phone, right? You're having a romantic dinner together. You're looking at a cell phone. Oh, yeah, yeah, whatever. You don't, you don't dare do that unless you're married 20 years, right? Like some of us. <laughs> it is an unhindered, focused time with our Lord, a quiet time. When we give Him our undivided attention to Him, Holy Spirit speaks to us. Because why? He wants to lead us. Whoever is led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Romans 8.14 If we are sons and daughters of God, the Holy Spirit wants to lead us. It's only that we don't sit down and listen to Him. The Bible teaches us and shows us that when the church sat down in prayer and in service to the Lord, the Holy Spirit spoke to them. Brothers and sisters, not only do we do quiet time, in our own time. But it is my prayer that we would share what we've heard from the Spirit as much as possible. As you share your application from the Word of God this week, as you share what God has done through your application this past week, and you hear brothers and sisters saying, God did that for you. Wow, God did this for me. And as we put these things together, we hear the voice of the Spirit in a clear fashion and manner undeniably, we'll be able to live and navigate this, this journey of spiritual life together in uncharted spiritual kingdom of God. I want to close with uh, one story that you might have heard of before from the book of Radical, David Platt. You know him, right? He used to, used to be the IMB president. He's now a uh, pastor over in the East Coast. He uh, has a story about when he was a pastor in Birmingham, Alabama, which, where we had the convention this past summer, right? And uh, he was praying. He was doing his quiet time. And uh, he heard the voice of the Spirit, which was, was wondered. He became to wonder, how many orphans are in our county? Jefferson County, that is, over there. And so after that prayer, he called the city and asked them, how, do we, how many orphans or you know, foster kids that are there in our community? And they told him there are 120 of them in our county. So with that information, uh, David Platt, he went back into prayer and he prayed. And then he preached and he challenged, saying, there are 120 orphans in our community can we adopt some of them? Can we prayerfully, each family, you know, it was a big church, 3,000 people, uh, can we adopt some of them? And after that message went out, people started to pray, and they ended up 
adopting 120 of them, all of them, in that church. When the church heard the voice of the Spirit, they put their faith into action, and it changed the community forever. And that's what it looks like to follow the Spirit. It's the unexpected. It's expanding our capacity of faith. It's expanding our spiritual horizon to see the amazing spiritual world that God has for us. I know some of you are leaving after this Sunday, and I want to bless you as you leave, as it's an adventure, truly the next chapter of your life, not just school-wise or career-wise, but with the Holy Spirit. You've experienced God in some ways, special ways. You are blessed so much here in this community. And now as the Spirit sends you out, he, will, he intends to expand your spiritual horizons to, ex, to experience the depth, the breadth, and the, and the greatness of God's love and the great, greatness of His work in this world. And as you experience that, you will be a greater, a bigger man and, or a woman of God. And isn't that the life we want to live our entire lives, for the rest of our lives? To be led by the Spirit, not just living day to day according to worldly things we see but living for an eternal purpose, a kingdom purpose, to be used solely in the right hand of God as God used Saul and Barnabas with his right hand to do his mission work in the entire Roman Empire. I pray that all of us this morning would be led by the Spirit in amazing ways that we could change not only our community, but the world for the name of Jesus Christ's sake. Let you go and chart the uncharted spiritual waters. Amen? Let's pray. As we go to our Lord, let's uh, 